Hi everybody and welcome to the Electronics and Programming Beginner's Guide. Today let's talk about timers. Uh, when timers is they're related to embedded systems. Uh, timers are very very important and very very versatile and they're in fact so important that every single microcontroller has some sort of a timer built into it. The reason why they're so important and so versatile is because a timer allows you to create a timing in your program. For example, if you need an event to occur every, let's say, 50 milliseconds over and over and over again, you do that with a timer. That a timer time, times out to 50 milliseconds and then it, it lets you know and you perform that event. Uh, or you need to do some sort of a calculation every 10 milliseconds. Or you uh, you want to check a, a button to debounce it every millisecond, and then you know if the if it sees that the button has stopped bouncing after 50 milliseconds, the button's considered uh, debounced. Uh, the way to get rid of those uh, pesky delays that are very very bad is to use a timer instead of a delay. So, a timer uh, when setting up a timer. Uh, you look at uh, three things. You look at your clock source. Uh, you look at your how much time or how fast the timer is running, and then you look at your output. And this is kind of a, a short setup list. So you would figure out this, figure out this, figure out this, and then your timer is set up. Uh, this is how I like to look at it, and. Uh, for explaining how a timer actually works, I'm actually going to uh, explain the clock source and then get into how the timer works because to me that seems like the easiest way of doing it. So let's take a look at the clock source first. In reality, a timer is actually a fancy pulse counter. So the idea is, is that the timer can detect whenever it sees a pulse and it will keep track of that. What gives timer their power is by selecting where those pulses are coming from. So for example, you can choose the internal clock of the uh, microcontroller and because you know what the internal clock of the microcontroller is, you know how far apart these pulses are. So whenever you uh, increment a pulse, you know how much time has gone by. For example, let's say we're using a 1 megahertz clock that's internal to the processor, so you know that the time from peak to peak here is 1 microsecond. So if you keep track of from this pulse to this pulse, you know that 1 microsecond has gone by. And the clock so there's generally lots of different clock sources that can be selected for timers. Those clock sources can be internal. Uh, some microcontrollers have multiple internal clocks. A uh, fast RC oscillator, a low RC oscillator, a low power oscillator. These clocks can also be external. It can be a uh, crystal number one or crystal number two and, or even a crystal for a real-time clock, a uh, 32.768 uh, uh, kilohertz crystal. So the idea is, and the thing to keep in mind, is what is the timer keeping track of and how far, uh, what the time is between pulses. So now how does the timer actually work? The timer has a, a timer register inside. And for this example, I'm using an 8-bit timer register, and this is very similar to, let's say, the uh, PIC16 F1508, uh, the one I did the wiring and the uh, uh, wrote the software to blink an LED in one of my previous videos. And there's nothing specifically special about that microcontroller, that specific PIC. It's just I had one lying around, so that's what I'm using as my examples. So the idea is the timer has a timer register. This timer register in the PIC-16 is an 8-bit number, and it starts off at 0. So the idea is every time the timer sees a pulse, it will increment the timer register. So you start off at 0, and you see a pulse, and you go to 
1. You see another pulse and you go to 2. And this continues up until you get you completely fill the number. So and we'll say these are in hexadecimal. If if you weren't aware, the zero x means that they're in hex. And this is actually often how they're represented in a data sheet. They will use hex, they won't use uh, decimal numbers. So get used to seeing this in this format. So eventually you will get to zero uh, x f e and then zero x f f. And 0xff is the largest number that can be stored in an 8-bit number. So whenever you go to count the next one, the timer will actually roll over back to 0. And this rollover event is important, and uh, I will tell you how it pertains to our situation for the time being, uh, in the, I'm sorry, in the, the next section. But said the thing, the important things to remember is you have a clock source that needs to be selected. You need to be aware of what that clock source is and how fast that clock source is going. And that every time the timer sees a pulse on that clock source, it will increment a counter in the timer register. Mm -hmm. And that whenever the register becomes full, it will overflow and roll over back to zero. Now I'm going to skip around a bit, uh, a bit as far as uh, the list I showed you earlier because understanding how a timer uh, output occurs or how you interact with the timer is important in understanding the uh, time slash speed aspect of the uh, timer because how you interact with it will depend on how you uh, decide on what speed the timer should be running at and or, or uh, how much time the timer is counting out. So there, there are really uh, two ways of interacting with a timer. You can either pull it, which means uh, your main software will actively check to see what the condition of the timer is, or you can use an interrupt. And I will eventually do a, com uh, a complete introductory video to interrupt, but for the time being, uh, what the interrupt will do is it will tell the main code that, hey, whatever the condition you set up for the timer is now true. So polling. As I mentioned, polling is actively checking in the main code to see uh, what the condition of the timer is. So uh, the easiest way to understand polling is uh, polling the time. So that timer register I mentioned previously, you uh, check to see how many times uh, the uh, timer has counted pulses or how much time has gone by. Uh, think of this time as a, a stopwatch, like you know, for track and field, you hit start and then you keep checking the uh, stopwatch to see how much time went by oh, I see that uh, 10 minutes has gone by, uh, so I need to do something. You know, I need to go get a drink of water or something along those lines. So that's the time portion. And this is the one we're going to start with kind of analyzing with the, the, the time and the speed aspect of it. The flag portion of it, the flag is related to the interrupt and uh, in so many words. So what happens is whenever uh, the timer uh, rolls over, it will set a uh, interrupt flag to tell you that the timer rolled over. But if the interrupt is not enabled, uh, an interrupt event will not occur, to, uh, occur, only the flag is set. So what your software can do is every so often it can check to see the state of the interrupt flag for the timer. And if the interrupt flag is set, you know that the timer has rolled over, you got to the end of the register and, you know, went back to zero. And you would clear the flag and then do the action that's required of the uh, timer routine that you're using. And I said, finally, you have the, the interrupt. So uh, if the interrupt is enabled, when the timer rolls over, you know, again, goes from the FF back to zero, uh, an interrupt event is triggered and the software will jump to 
a location called an interrupt service routine. In the interrupt service routine, then you can manage your uh, timer and then jump back into the main code just where you left off. So this is the interrupt is the uh, way you can make a very time critical events occur because the interrupt will actually stop your main code, jump into the interrupt so you can do your business. So now let's take a look at how polling works with time. This is a very uh, generic statement of how uh, polling works with time. You have your time register and you compare that register to some number. So if what's stored in the timer register is greater than uh, some number, then go ahead and reset the timer register to zero and do stuff just as generic as it could possibly be. The important part is it's a, that this is the basic layout. So don't forget to reset your timer. So, so this is kind of a stopwatch kind of thing that you start the stopwatch and you check it occasionally and watch once the stopwatch exceeds a particular time, then you go ahead and stop the stopwatch. Well, it's, I'm sorry, I guess you reset the stopwatch and the stopwatch uh, counts up again from zero. So I said, if if you have exceeded the time that you are, you are counting out, then you go ahead and reset. So this is great and all, but how do you actually, you know, how do you do the counterpart? How do you actually uh, set up a time for the timer? And let's see how that works. Let's work out what number we would actually fill into the if statement I just showed you. Uh, let's say we want to do a timer that does one millisecond. With uh, the example I gave previously, with a clock of one megahertz, and in the pick sixteen, one megahertz would equal your F O S C. So, if this sounds confusing, uh, take a look at my uh, time for you to get a watch or oscillator post. So, if you look at the data sheet for this timer, whenever you select. FOSC, it's not FOSC, it's actually FOSC over 4. So the idea is for whenever four pulses of the clock go by, one pulse is delivered to the timer. So if at 1 megahertz is FOSC, the, the peak to peak time is a 1 microsecond. If uh, FOSC is over 4, then the time to go by is 4 microseconds. If you then take 1 millisecond and divide it by 4 microseconds, what you get is uh, you would have to count 250 pulses for a 1 millisecond to go by. The problem with 250 is the in this case, the minimum amount of, uh, or I guess the maximum amount of time that the timer can count out is uh, 0xff, which equals 255. So if you keep checking the timer register, you only have between 50 and 55 to catch the fact that enough time has gone by. And you would have to sample the timer pretty fast for that. Uh, to catch that. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a prescaler. A prescaler and postscaler for that. Well, a, a prescaler and postscaler are very similar. Just one happens at the beginning, the other one happens at the end. Uh, the PIC16 does not have a postscaler, but I just wanted to mention it so if you see it, you understand where it is. So what the prescaler does is similar to the FOSC over 4, it actually does another division. So if uh, uh, once you get one pulse out of F, uh, this FOSC over four, it would take so many pulses again to send a pulse to the timer. So there's uh, several options available for the prescaler, and by default, the prescaler is set to one, meaning one pulse gets through. So we're going to set the prescaler. 
to 2. So two pulses have to come out of here into here to then one pulse get to the timer. So what happens with the prescale over 2, the time uh, to roll over, the time per pulse now becomes 8 microseconds. And now if you take one millisecond and divide it by the 8 microseconds, what you get is uh, 62.5. Well, you can't really deal with the five because uh, the timer doesn't deal with uh, floats. But what this does with the 62 number, you can get a decent, uh, uh, decently accurate time for one millisecond. And you don't have to check it at breakneck speed because 62 up to 255 is quite a range. So even if you miss the timer, uh, when it first rolls over, you still have quite a bit of time to catch it and then roll it over. As you can see, this isn't the most efficient setup as far as a timer goes because you constantly have to keep checking it and uh, the, the time isn't super accurate. So kind of the next level up as far as timers go is if you pull the timer flag. So let's look at how that would work. This is what the general topology looks like if you're pulling the interrupt flag for the timer. So you do if the timer flag, which in this case for the PIC16, it's the intcon bits.tmr0 if is equal to 1, meaning the, the flag has set. You need to reset the timer, and I'll talk about this in just a second. And then you need to do your stuff. But here's the important part. You have to then reset the flag yourself. You have to set the flag equal to zero. And this is actually kind of how interrupts work. But in this case, we're not triggering an interrupt. We are uh, checking the status of the interrupt flag manually. So now let's take a look at how to uh, reset the timer because there's some really neat uh, tricky stuff that you can do here to get a really nice accurate timer. Uh, real quick, what I forgot to mention, if you are uh, using the interrupt flag, you need to reset the interrupt flag uh, when your code is initializing to then be able to uh, use it properly throughout your code. But uh, let's use the example we had previously because we want to do one millisecond with a one megahertz uh, FOSC, which is one U second. FOSC over four is uh, four uh, microseconds. And one millisecond divided by four microseconds gives you a count of 250. So how would you use this to uh, get the uh, timer to overflow? to be able to trigger the flag because the flag triggers whenever the timer overflows. It goes from uh, zero XFF back to uh, all zeros. And one way of doing it is you could do uh, TMR zero uh, equals to five and then let it count up from there. But the problem with this is, is it doesn't compensate for anything that uh, it only starts counting from the time you loaded this in, but let's say you want to know uh, exactly how much time has gone by uh, every millisecond, that uh, each time you check it, exactly a millisecond has gone by. And there's a really neat trick to this. What you do is you do TMR0 equals TMR0 minus 249. So, a couple of things. First of all, the reason why it's 249 is because uh, to, roll for, to roll the timer over correctly, you actually need one less count than what you did because this references with one and this one references with zero. The other neat thing uh, with timers, the timers use entirely unsigned integer math. And what happens if you take a really small number and subtract a, a large number from it? Well, the timer actually ends up going backwards. What, uh, what I mean by that is if you, if you took a 0 and subtracted 249, your answer 
because this is all constrained uh, to a untimed char or eight bits, the answer would actually be six because the uh, the timer uh, the the way the math works out it you actually roll backwards uh, what's neat about the setup also is let's say uh, you were not able to check the flag immediately when it rolled over so timer zero had actually run like six or seven steps if you uh, use this to reset the timer those six steps actually still count toward the next one millisecond count uh, moving forward. It said for timers that do not have a period register, which is something that I'm going to go over here shortly, this is a really, really neat trick to make a timer f uh, fairly accurate. Uh, this is what the topology would look like if we were using the straight interrupt for the timer. When using an interrupt, you have to clear the interrupt flag in initialization and uh, turn on uh, enable the interrupt. And then you have a function called uh, uh, with uh, called interrupt. You can actually call it whatever you want, but it has the attribute ISR. And I'll go over this in a little more detail in a video on uh, interrupt. But inside the interrupt, uh, you check to see, you, it, this looks almost exactly like uh, you were pulling for the uh, flag in the previous setup. The only difference is this function will get called whenever the interrupt flag goes from 0 to 1. Automatically, you don't have to do anything for it. So first you have to check to see uh, that the uh, flag for TMR0 is set just like the other function. Then you uh, reset your uh, timer. And this is actually a shorthand for timer, uh, TMR0 minus equals 249. So what this does is equivalent to what I showed you before, where it's TMR0 equals TMR0 minus 249. So this is just a nice little shorthand. And then you do your stuff. And then you have to, don't forget to clear the flag uh, for the interrupt. Otherwise, if you do not clear the flag, what will happen is the interrupt will trigger again, and you will get stuck inside the interrupt in an infinite loop. And then, uh, so int con bits dot tmr zero if equals to zero, and then you exit your interrupt. Uh, the kind of little primer that I will give for interrupts is this do stuff section has to be short and sweet. Because if you're sitting in an interrupt, you can't do anything else because the interrupt is uh, totally occupying your clock cycle. So uh, if you want to, let's say, uh, as an example, uh, count up a timer so you can do, you know, time plus plus. So every time you go through the interrupt, uh, you can see how much time has gone by, let's say milliseconds. And so uh, the way I set this up is so almost identical to if you were pulling the interrupt flag, but instead in this case the interrupt would be enabled and you would jump over into this function to uh, whenever the timer rolls over. Now that you understand the basics of timers, of how a timer register works, how what happens when the timer register overflows, uh, some different ways to check to see how much time has gone by, uh, let's talk about uh, a 16-bit well, pick, and that could be a, a PIC24, or a DSPIC33, or a DSPIC30, so they're all 16-bit picks. There are two major differences between the 8-bit pick we talked about before and their 16-bit uh, brethren. The first one is obviously it's a 16-bit processor, so your register is now 16 bits wide. So you can count to a much, much higher number, but the general concept is still exactly the same. With your timer register, you, you start at 0, you count up to 1, and then you go all the way through to... 0x f f f e you get to 0x f f f f and then you roll over back to 0 the other uh, difference with the 16 bit processor is now you have the addition of a uh, 
period register, PR1. So if we're talking about a timer one on a 16-bit processor, the timer register is TMR1 and the period register is TR1. So you can find all of these in the data sheet for the specific processor that you have in the timer section and it'll be listed timer one, timer two, timer three, timer four, etc. So what makes the period register really neat is that uh, remember the trickery that we had to do to get the timer to overflow exactly when we wanted to. Well, with uh, the period of register, you can actually put in exactly when you want the timer to overflow instead of waiting for the timer register to fill up completely. So if we still use our same example, of uh, using let's say an interrupt to do to count out one millisecond and one megahertz everything that we did uh, in the uh, uh, previous example what we would do is we do PR1 equals to 240 oops, 249 and this setup takes care of everything for us. So whenever the timer one register gets to 249 and 250, this is considered an overflow and the timer register will reset back to zero. So this is just a general uh, initiation for timers. Uh, timers can be uh, very interesting and very complex to work with. So this is just an initiation. And don't forget, the way, as I mentioned earlier, the way to set up a timer is you want to first know what the source of the timer is going to be. You want to know the speed slash time that the timer is counting out and what the output is going to be. Are you going to pull the timer? Are you going to pull the interrupt flag? Are you actually going to use an interrupt? Uh, other things that you may look into for the future for example, the 8-bit pick has an ability to bind two timers together to form a 16-bit timer in case you need to count out more time. Uh, the 16-bit uh, pick has a similar feature where you can bind two timers together to form a 32-bit timer so you can count out even more time. So a, if you have any questions uh, about anything that I've gone over uh, today, uh, please uh, leave it in the comment section down below, either in YouTube or on my website. Uh, if you like my video, please give me a thumbs up. Uh, and uh, please subscribe because uh, that always helps. Thank you for watching.